Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Schenker, Chairman of the Futurist Institute, President of Prestige Economics, resident of Austin. Happy to be here to talk to you all today. This is perhaps a more somber subject. I did not pick the title yesterday. This is a title I picked a little while ago, Founding Funding and running a startup in a time of economic and financial market uncertainty. And by the way, if any of you want a copy of the deck, just come up to me afterwards. I'll give you a card, or if you have a card, like I'm kind of old school like that, I have cards, I will give you a card, you send me an email, you get the thing. You can also just go to my website, jasonschenker.com, send me a note, be like, I really want that deck. So this is really timely. And I know it's something on everyone's minds. So I, I want to start by taking sort of a 10,000 foot view. And I want to talk about how some short term headlines have really big implications for the long term. And the way I'm going to structure the conversation today, we're going to look at big, important macroeconomic trends and pain points for companies that start up serve or any business in general. And then we're going to look at that founding, funding, and running startups and what we need to think about. It all starts sort of with the current upside and downside economic risks, right? U.S. labor market strong. That's the good news. Fed policy rates are near the peak. They're not there yet. Peak CPI inflation is likely behind us. So U.S. consumer inflation was 9.1% back in June. Today it's 64 It's lower and the peak's likely behind us. Scavenger hunt economics, those dynamics are easing where many different companies, regardless of industry, startup, large cap, doesn't matter. They've been trying to get the people they need, the equipment, the components, the people. They've been really struggling with that, but those tensions have eased. GDP expanded in the last couple of quarters after contracting for two quarters, and good news, consumer debt delinquencies are low. On the downside, though, high labor costs are likely to persist. Some more Fed policy tightening is ahead, March 22nd, right around the corner. Year-on-year -year inflation is likely to remain elevated, so 6.4 is not the Fed's target, which is two. That has implications for a cost of capital, interest rates, and funding. Cold War II is unlikely to end quickly. This is another really big pain point I'll talk about in a second. We see the Silicon Valley Bank failure presents contagion risks. And there's a really big question here. With Silicon Valley Bank, is this the camel's nose under the tent of a broader financial crisis brewing? Or is it a more isolated incident? But even if it's isolated, there's never just one cockroach. Which brings me to the fact that we've got FTX and Silvergate here, also in the not too distant past. Like Silvergate just the past week with their liquidation as well. And what does that mean? Perhaps most importantly for some startups, folks in the crypto space or in banking, regulatory focus and scrutiny will increase dramatically in the next 12 months. So let's start with the founding, funding, and running a startup. Founding first up, I want to talk about something that I learned when I was in consulting. I've run my own shop since 2009. Before that, I worked at McKinsey for a couple of years. I was a risk specialist. I did content direction on different projects. And there are two rules around getting a consulting project or getting new business. There's only two things. There's sack of money, right? You're trying to get business. You've got the thing. Like, here's the vision, sack of money. And there's sack of money on fire. That's it. So as we think about the key pain points, and this is really important if you're doing B2B work, or if this is your startup works with other businesses, there are three key pain points right now. I've already alluded to them. Labor market tightness, Cold War II, and high sticky inflation. If you can tap into one of those three, that can turn into significant revenue and drive your business, and you probably won't have any trouble doing fundraises. Those are the three pain points of almost every single business right now that I talk to. And I talk to businesses across industries. This is every business right now. They're worried about getting the people. They're worried about the decoupling of global supply chains, further rising tensions with China. 
and they're worried about what, what happens if prices don't go down? What happens if the Fed keeps raising rates? Because that's also one of the things that triggered both problems at Silvergate and at Silicon Valley Bank. So let's talk about pain point one. We'll go through each of these three, and then we'll talk about the funding implications, and we'll talk about running a startup and those implications as well. So pain point one, jobs. Labor market is really strong right now. Unemployment rate just yesterday went up to 3.6%. That's really low. It was 34 though, in January. That was the lowest since May of 1969. And while the unemployment rate went up in February, it went up because more people came into the workforce. It did not go up because people lost their jobs. Moreover, job number was good. 311,000 net new jobs for the month of February after over 500,000 jobs added in January. And you can see on the left, the unemployment rate going down from Feb 2021, just straight down. Non-farm payrolls on the right, lots and lots of months of lots and lots of jobs. By the way, if you haven't had trouble finding people at any point in, say, the last 12 months, don't tell anyone around you, <laughs> right? They're going to want to know. And folks often ask, where's the labor force? Where are the workers? Right now, the labor force is at a record level. Over 166 million people are in the labor force. It's never been bigger. Labor force is comprised of two sets of numbers. One is people with jobs. The other is people who want work and are looking for work. It's not the number of people collecting unemployment. It's people who want work and look for it. That's where that 3.6% comes from. But if we look at how many people are collecting unemployment, like maybe you've struggled finding people, like most businesses have, maybe your clients or your prospective clients have struggled, and they wonder, where are the workers? Oh, they're collecting unemployment. They are not. Less than, uh, just now, around 1% of all people in the labor force are collecting unemployment. 1.7 million. There's 166 plus million people in the labor force. So around 1% are collecting unemployment. That's nothing. This is a very, very tight job market. That means if you're a startup focused on something that automates anything at all, you have an ROI value proposition, probably on a B2B basis. Additionally, if you look, the record low for jobless claims was set back in 1969, just below a million. But since then, the labor force has increased 107%. So if we consider how many people are unemployed right now collecting unemployment compared to any time in history, this is pretty much an all-time low. We're like right on top of that. Number of people losing their jobs is really low, too. Most recent data, out just this past Thursday, two days ago, 211,000 people lost their jobs in the prior week. The record low is 162,000. The labor force is more than double the size, 110% bigger than it was when it was 162,000 back in 1968. This is a crazy tight job market. And I know that the, the layoffs, especially in startups, are getting a lot of attention. They are headline grabbing. They are nerve wracking. This data is from layoffs.fyi. And you can see employees laid off is red on the left axis. The blue is companies with layoffs on the right axis. And you can see the most recent four quarters have been harrowing. They have. And if we look at government data, this is from the BLS. The blue line here, this goes back to the early part of 2021. It represents layoffs across different industries. The red is tech layoffs. And you can see how much more the tech layoffs are than across the economy. And that's not insignificant. It's important. But if we consider things on a relative basis, it's a little bit different. This data is from Charter. It's from company filing data as well as layoffs.fyi. Four different companies, Meta, Alphabet, Microsoft, Apple. Number of employees from 2018 through 2022 and after the most recent layoffs. So for Meta, for example, there were 36,000 employees in 2018, which went up to 87, and now it's down to 76, which is still 40,000 more jobs than the 36,000 in 2018. 
we look at Alphabet, 99,000 in 2018, up to 187,000 last year, now down to 175. Still 76,000 more employees than in 2018. Similar dynamic at Microsoft, 131 goes up to 221, down to 211. This is still 80,000 more employees than in 2018. Apple's gone up, but it's 132 to 164, and they haven't had layoffs. But the point I, I want to make with this is, although there's a lot of attention grabbing around the layoffs, there are a lot more people working in technology, and the job market is really, really tight. I want to drive this home. Right now, there are 10.8 million open jobs for the month of January. This data came out just last week, just like a couple days ago. To give you some idea of what these graphs are, these are from the Federal Reserve Economic, Data Economic Database, which has the, the cute acronym FRED. And if you look at them, right, what this shows, we go back, this is, these shaded bars represent recessions. This is, you look at 2001, there were a little over 5 million jobs before that recession in 2000, 2001. Before the Great Recession of Financial Crisis, there were about 5 million open jobs uh, at, at, before the recession started. It went down to almost two. At the beginning of COVID, there were 7 million open jobs. So seven, yeah, about... Yeah about, about, uh, yeah, about 7 million open jobs. And today there's 10.8, 3.8 million more open jobs than before COVID. Or twice as many open jobs as there were before the financial crisis or before the 2001 tech bust. This is a lot of open jobs, right? 3.8 million more than before COVID. And yeah, it's down, right? It's down from like 12 million open jobs to 10.8. We think about the financial crisis getting down to two. That's a long way from here. So while people are really worried about the labor force, and you, you know, you might be worried about your jobs, which is very understandable, especially in the tech sector. The labor market is really, really strong, and there are millions and millions and millions of open positions. Similarly, if you're trying to hire, even though you see the head headlines of all the layoffs, right, their attention grabbing, you might still find it's difficult to hire the exact people you need because the labor market is crazy tight. There have never been this many open jobs in the history of the country. If we look at a sector, even like manufacturing, for example, right, there were... <laughs> This is crazy, but if you look at different times before the Great Recession, there were 400,000 uh, 400, open jobs, right? Just before COVID, it was around 400,000. Now it's over 800,000 open jobs. It's in all kinds of industries where we see job openings like we've never seen before. And hourly wages are up. So here's the good news, bad news. If you're trying to hire people, it's very expensive. If you're a worker, wages have gone up $4.54 since COVID started. I like to think I'm young-ish, and I can remember working for less than $4.54 an hour. I'm 45. In the last three months, that's how much the hourly wage has gone up. So if you're wondering why it's still expensive to pay people, this is part of it. And by the way, the wages don't go down, even if the economy slows. If we look, here's the Great Recession. Wages still went up during the Great Recession. The other good news is if you're a startup focused on solving any of these labor market problems or automated solutions, AI, robotics, anything like that, you are solving really big problems that affect the entire economy, every business top to bottom. Uh, but wait, there's more. Uh, so there are some bigger labor market risks ahead, and I want to drive home some of these numbers. The year that I'm really focused on is 2026. That's the year baby boomers, so in two years, nine months, and 20-ish days, right? 
Baby boomers start turning 80. Gen Xers will be 61. Millennials will be 45. And Gen Zers will be 29. So you're seeing a really major generational shift where a lot of workers are leaving. So the question, maybe you've talked to folks who say this, maybe you've thought this, where did the workers go? A lot of folks over 55 left the labor force during COVID, right? In the Great Recession, there were people who thought about retiring, right, 2007 to 2009. They can't retire, their houses were underwater, they lost their homes, their stock portfolio crashed, and they said, I'm gonna have to work for another decade. Fast forward another decade, right? You're like 2019, 2020, home prices are at record levels, stock prices are at record levels, people are older, they retire, they leave the workforce, they're gone. This change is gonna be really important. It's also gonna put other pressures on the economy and businesses. For example, Medicare is likely to be insolvent in 2026. This isn't a new forecast, this has been the forecast consistently for the last four years that 2026 is the year where Medicare is insolvent. That is paid for half by employees through payroll taxes. The other half is paid for by employers. And if you run a startup and it's yours, this is self-employment tax. And you pay for all of it. Social security is expected to last a little longer. By the way, these aren't like fringe forecasts, right? This is the forecast from the Social Security Administration that says it will be out of money in 2026. The forecast from the Social Security Administration about when it is insolvent for all Social Security, not just Medicare, is 2034. Probably, like if we're lucky, they've, they've had to move this forecast earlier in recent years. So it could be sooner than, than expected. But these aren't like some kind of crazy, you know, video online where people are talking conspiracy theories. This is the official government data of when they're gonna run out of cash. This is going to affect what you pay your workers, what you pay for taxes for your workers, what your taxes look like. And again, further incentivizes any kind of automated solutions you can provide of any kind. There are also gonna be some other structural issues. So as we see a demographic shift, perhaps the thing I'm most concerned about is in healthcare. Right now, the Association of American Medical Colleges is expecting by 2034, again, that's when Social Security is expected to be insolvent. We're gonna have a shortage of between 37,800 uh, and 124,000 physicians. But that's not even the biggest problem. The biggest problem is by 2030, we're also gonna have, uh, we're, we're gonna have a massive unmet need probably for home health and personal care aids, uh, and many other things. Nurse practitioners, physi physician, um, physician assistants, physical therapists, and medical and health services managers. All categories of healthcare almost are seeing major growth through the end of this decade and beyond, and there will be major shortfalls for people. So med tech, anything health related, there are massive unmet needs. They will be growing as we think about that generational shift 2026, Gen 1, baby boomers start turning 80. So that's one pain point. Anything you can do to stress how your solution attacks any of that, objective data, real problems that companies are facing, that's a big value add. Pain point number two is Cold War II. And this all starts with a wedding. Many people missed it. February 4th, 2022 at the Olympics, China and Russia say that there will be no limit to their cooperation and that they strongly defend the outcomes of the Second World War. So it's not like a June wedding, it's like a Game of Thrones wedding, <laughs> right? And that sets off the Russian war on Ukraine and China getting more aggressive in its military spending and its stance regarding Taiwan. I know most people expected the conflict to end quickly. I do DOD work. I've given talks to the Foreign Service Institute, the CIA, SOCOM, NATO, lots of different groups. One of the things that I've consistently been stressing about this is that it's unlikely to end quickly. 
I know people's attention spans have been compressed by TikTok, which may or may not become illegal in the short term, but wars don't necessarily end fast. And if we look at where the, the battle lines are, right, this is the goal. The goal is, you know, Russia, World War II at the end, bigger, China bigger, and the battle lines now for the occupied territories in Ukraine, right, where we see that these four eastern provinces, areas that Russia has annexed, the red here on the map, these are daily maps produced by the Institute for the Study of War, looks like a rock in a hard place where it's going to be very difficult for Ukraine to take all of it back, and it's going to be very difficult for Russia to take more. And so the outcome could be something like Korea, which most people forget this year. It will be 73 years old. That war never ended. There's an armistice and a demilitarized zone and missiles that occasionally fly in the air for testing, right? But that war's not over. I am concerned as I think about the Russian war on Ukraine, that this could easily go on for years or decades. That's the Russian front of Cold War II. The China front looks a little bit different. This is a survey from the Atlantic Council. About 70% of military, national security, and other experts did a survey, 149. 70% of them plus said that within the next 10 years they expect China will attempt to retake Taiwan by force. Thinking back to Cold War I, where Korea was one of the big kickoffs, I think about another thing that was really important at the beginning of Cold War I, which was the Berlin blockade and the airlift that followed. I consider also the fact that China has been able to turn atolls in the South China Sea into full-blown islands, then with runways, then with ports, then with full military bases, because they moved imperceptibly slow. So the thought is, China might not take a very quick, direct approach. Russia did the thing we often see in Western European conflicts. There's tension, and it turns into a really fast war. China goes so slow that if we were to respond in a sharp way, it would seem perhaps extreme. It might not meet with a good reception. So if I was a smart guy advising a bad guy, thinking about how we've seen Cold War I play out, what I might expect is not that China attempts by force to do an amphibious assault four times the distance of Dover to Calais, an amphibious assault, by the way, they've never done one, and that destroys in the process the semiconductor industry and most of the Taiwanese economy. That's not what they want. The Russians don't care if Ukraine is a mountain of rubble. They did it in Aleppo, they did it in Grozny, they do not care. In Taiwan, China really wants the semiconductor industry. They want it intact. So I don't see an amphibious assault. What I'd see is a blockade, an embargo. They won't turn away our naval vessels, but I could see many countries being dissuaded from trying to get through a Chinese blockade of Taiwan. What does that mean for you in this room? It means that supply chain risks are really high for technology companies. 90% of the highest value semiconductors in the world are made in Taiwan. That's a risk. Another risk is anything else, trade or supply chain related to China, especially dual use technologies. I can see a time in a five to 10 year window where it is no longer legal to buy internet connected devices made in China. Phones, tablets, computers. If they're made in China, we may not be allowed to buy them in the US anymore in a five to 10 year window, maybe shorter. There's a precedent for this. We do DOD contract work. There's a list of things you can't use when you're doing DOD work for the US Department of Defense. What does it include? Well, you can't use diamonds from Sierra Leone, pornography from Russia, or technology from China. 
That's been the case for years. That requirement is likely to spread. One of the groups I'm in, because I live here in Austin, I'm in Texas, uh, there is something at the federal level called the Business Roundtable. It's 100 CEOs who advise policymakers of both parties, nonpartisan organization. There are 27 affiliate organizations at different states around the country where there are 100 CEOs who advise policymakers at the state and the federal level, both parties, nonpartisan organization. The one in Texas is called the Texas Business Leadership Council. I am one of those 100 CEOs. We fly up to D.C. every year. We meet with representatives from both parties. We meet with the administration, whichever party it is, and we meet with usually one or two of our senators. And I will tell you, there were many differences between the Trump administration and the Biden administration when we met with them and we talked to them. There was no daylight between them on the approach to China. And there is very strong bipartisan support for this nationally. Part of this is because there's a risk, not just in the U.S., but globally, of China not just taking military action, but using financial leverage, soft diplomacy in other countries. For example, China issues 70%, currently holds 70% of all emerging market debt. So if you're an emerging market with higher interest rates right now, and you're paying a lot more for food and, and, and energy, which are dollar denominated, the dollar's strong, who's your bank? It's China. And they're, you know, they might come for some kneecaps, right? It's not a friendly lender if you need a refi. And so this is part of the reason 82% of Americans have an unfavorable view of China. This is data from Pew Research. And if you look back, just five years, four or five years ago, it was almost 50-50. But now it's 82%. Because China presents a risk, not just to the US economy or US businesses, but globally through debt trap diplomacy. And while the country's very divided on many political issues, this is one that there's a lot of agreement around. There are also a couple other things I want to highlight that's going on globally with China. This data is from Charter. It's UN data. Uh, this year, India's population is expected to surpass China. China last year had more deaths than births, and the population declined. It's expected to decline a lot further. The median forecast, or the mid-case that the UN put out, is by the end of the century, there are 770 million people living in China. India, getting bigger, though. Nigeria expect to pass the U.S. in 2050. We think about who the global players are, it's going to change around a little bit. But there could be as few as 488 million people in China at the end of the century. It's 488, 767, and around 1.153 billion. Those are the three forecasts. But that low case, less than half a billion people, that would be a really big change to their labor market. And their answer has been robots and automation, a lot of them. So there's this idea, right, and a fear in the US around all kinds of automation and technology. And while it's a fear here, it's a reality in Asia. Birth rates are falling in every country in the world. They're falling significantly in China. They're also falling significantly in Korea, in Japan, and in many countries in Europe that have extremely low birth rates, like Italy and Poland. Robots and automation are gonna be a critical part of that solution. And this is why the technology piece is just so important. The last thing I want to say about Cold War II ties into sustainability. Another trend that's not going away, if you're tied to sustainability, this is great. This is really important. This will be regulated. This will come from the financial regulators. It is coming down, and, and I know there's folks, sometimes I've talked to folks, and they tell me they don't believe in climate change. I don't care if you don't believe in it, Maybe you don't believe in audit or accounting either, but the financial regulators and the people who lend you money will care about your sustainability metrics. And if you don't start reporting on your scope one, scope two, scope three, credit rating agency is gonna downgrade you, you won't have access to capital, you'll lose your customers, you'll lose your vendors, you'll lose everybody. 
But one of the tricky parts about electrification and sustainability in Cold War II, so if you think the only solution to sustainability is electric vehicles and that will solve all problems, there's a problem with this tied into Cold War II, which is that a lot of the materials in the batteries come from China and Russia. So if things get more tense on the trade side and we see more tariffs and more trade restrictions, more import controls, getting to sustainability goals through electrification, through electric vehicles is going to be more difficult just because we won't be able to get the materials we need for the batteries. So those are the first two pain points. Number three is high sticky inflation, right? And sticky inflation, that's, that's what economists talk about, right? It's just not going down very fast. And you can see that, right? This is the blue line is inflation, CPI, it's what like everybody pays. The red line is economist inflation, which excludes food and energy because economists neither eat nor consume energy, right? We just eat people's souls, we don't, we don't consume food. <laughs> But if we look, you know, this is that 9.1% in June, and here we are down at 6.4%. And you can see inflation, year-on-year -year rates are going down, which looks really good until you realize that the Fed's target is down here and doesn't fit on the graph. <laughs> it's 2%, we're at 6.4, more than 3x. So it's gonna take a little bit more oomph. That's gonna be a big challenge. Part of the issue is rent. Owner's equivalent rent is one quarter of total CPI and one third of core CPI. The most recent rent numbers are up 8.6% year on year, the most since September of 1981. If this is a quarter of CPI and it's 8.6, a quarter of this is 2.15 percentage points year on year. You can't get to the Fed's target just with this. Assuming nothing else was up year on year, you wouldn't be able to get there even still because of rent. Part of the reason rent's up is that rental vacancies in the US are 5.8%, the lowest number since 1984. So there's nothing to rent. And that's why rents are up, and that's making inflation sticky too. And with higher interest rates, it's tough to incentivize people to engage in new construction. So this could keep inflation sticky as well. One good sign though, producer inflation, which is for wholesale goods, that's come down a lot. For goods, it's 7.5. Yes, 7.5 is more than 6.4, but it was 17.9 in June. So this is coming down quickly, and this usually feeds through to the consumer. I think consumer inflation is going to go down. That's our forecast. But it might not go down fast enough for the Fed's tastes. And the rent piece could be sticky still. And that's why interest rates are up. So this is the Fed funds rate, but I want to talk about some other levels of interest rates that are going to be important as we think about some of the capital costs that companies are thinking about. For example, a two-year treasury, uh, currently 4.9%. Last year it was 1.68. Pretty big increase in the cost of capital. I had a, a discussion with another speaker before I came in here and I was telling him there are CD rates right now that are between 5 and 5.5% 5 .5 for a CD, which is FDIC insured. We think about a risk return profile. Startups have bigger risk, but bigger return. You look at the stock market. Well, depending on the numbers you use, it's between 6% or 8% or 10% over a long-term period. But five and a half with no risk is a really sweet number. And so you find some people might be putting their money in those kinds of risk, riskless assets. Ten-year treasury, just below 4%. Last year, 194. It was a little higher a couple months ago. It's a little bit down now. If this goes down further, that would reflect conviction that the Fed's going to kill inflation. They're going to get it down. But it's a lot higher cost of capital. The riskier you go up, the higher it is. This is junk bonds. 
Last year they were just below 6%, now they're 8.6%. It's down a lot though from November when it was over 9%, over, it was almost 10% back in November. Triple C and lower, which is distressed debt. Last year, 979, currently 14.53, but it was 17%. Riskier debt, up a lot, very expensive. So when people are looking at startups, they're, they're looking at these rates of return. Would it be better to put money in junk bonds? Would it be better to put money in distressed debt? Where can I get high yield for high risk? These rates are up a lot. When triple C, by the way, triple C and lower, triple C bonds mean you're gonna lose half your principal, like on average. Triple C and lower means you're going to lose, at best, only half your principal. And that's yielding now 15, but you know, we look back, you know, we look back here to, to mid 2021, and it was yielding between like, like around 7%. It's more than double that now. Emerging market debt, similar story, right? Those yields 14.75. Last year, though, they were 16, so they're down a little bit. Emerging market risk is off, but still high. The implications around this, right? We've got persistent high inflation. Central banks are still raising interest rates. Financial markets are under pressure because of a high cost of capital. The result is rapidly slowing global growth. This is also really important on the startup side because your valuation is often determined by expected future cash flows, which are discounted by a weighted average cost of capital. And if you have a higher interest rate, the valuation of your company is lower. Here's the big takeaway. You do not want to be acquired in a high interest rate environment. You want to acquire, but you don't want to be acquired because your valuation will be a lot lower than it would be in a low interest rate environment. So if you can hang on until things get better, that will give you a much higher valuation. GDP, global GDP, I won't talk too much about this, but last year 3.4%, this year it's expected to be 2.9, but in 2021 it was around 5.5%. That's a pretty big slowdown, especially in the US and Europe, right? This year, last year, US around 2%, this year expected to be closer to 1.5, Europe last year 3.5, this year expected to be less than 1%. Manufacturing is contracting. This is the US, Eurozone, and China. 50 is the break even. They've been below 50 for most of the past year for China. Uh, China's bounced up just this past month. But US and Europe are under pressure. We aggregate the three series. They have a break even of 50. There's three of them. So the aggregate's 150. We're below that line. Global manufacturing is contracting. It's usually a leader of economic growth, but it's not contracting a lot. This is the Great Recession. This is the COVID recession, this is now. So it's, and, and by the way, we're coming off of record all-time highs for this aggregate series. So things have slowed, but they're not too, too bad. And in the US, things are better than a lot of other places. I wanna point out some, maybe, hopefully, like lessons learned. Mortgage rates are up 6.73%, but if we look, mortgage credit quality never looked so good. This is the most recent data out just in the past week or so. This is, uh, these stack bars represent quarterly debt mortgage origination. The most important thing I want you to think about is the light blue mountain over here are 760 plus credit scores. And that's two thirds to three quarters of all the mortgages issued since the beginning of 2020. We've got, and by the way, they, those mortgages were issued to the best credit quality with the lowest interest rates in history. So even though mortgage rates are up, is there risk of another housing crisis? And I don't think so. We look on the left side of the chart and there's lots of different colors here which represent other grades of credit quality, not just a 760 plus credit score. The credit score doesn't just fall out of the sky. If we look at total delinquencies of debt, right now, this quarter, as we sit here, the most recent data, out of all the debt held by consumers in the US, 16.9 trillion, only 2.5% is delinquent. Lowest it's ever been in history. So I feel really good about, if we get past the next 12 months or so, we're gonna be in a better economic situation. And we learned the lessons of the housing crisis. 
but it looks like we might have forgotten some of the lessons from 2001. A couple implications here. Because borrowing money is expensive, right? It's weighed on profits, high interest rates make valuations fall, less risky investments become more attractive. The implication is then there's a strategic focus on cash flow. And I know many of you, if you work for startups, you live and breathe and die by how much runway you have and how much cash you have, and that is everything. And that's why there's such a big risk of emerging tech consolidation and failures. And the advice that I've been giving to businesses of all kinds for the past year has been focus on ROI and minimize costs. Account for sticky inflation. If you have contracts with vendors, with, with customers, with labor, account for sticky inflation. Prepare for a protracted Cold War II. On that last DC team meeting that I had where we flew in a bunch of CEOs, we also met, not just with our congressmen and the administration, we also met with the business roundtable itself. And we had a trade discussion. One of the people in our group, she's a CEO of a manufacturing company. She asked the trade expert, what should I do? I get a component from China. What should I do? And the trade expert says, can you get it from anywhere else? The CEO says, no. Trade expert says, you need to get it from somewhere else. <laughs> Focus on operational res By the way, it's a lot funnier to tell than to see that happen in person. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, whew, right? Um, focus on operational resilience and cash flow. I can't say it enough. If anything you do as a startup or a business assists in any of these things, especially cash flow, reducing any kind of risk, adding operational resilience, anything like that, you want to stress that now more than ever. And then the last piece, you want to assess options to reduce or offset risks. For funding purposes, right, if this is what I'm telling businesses and every business needs to know this, if you're trying to get funding, what do you need to be thinking about? You need to know that the scrutiny of business plans is increasing. You need to stress pain point solutions, the three things I just talked about, labor, inflation, Cold War II. If you're doing B2B work, that's what you need to stress all day long, twice on Sunday. Emphasize ROI of whatever solutions you provide. Everyone is ROI focused right now. When you get five, five and a half percent in a CD rate, everyone wants to know what kind of money are you gonna bring me? Because I can do stuff for no risk now and actually make some money, which wasn't true two years ago. And whatever you're doing, frame it as practical. And I know that's not something most startup folks you know, maybe wanna hear, right? But at the end of the day, what sells right now is practical ROI driven, automation, labor solutions, inflation solutions, decosting, anything like this. That's what sells right now and will sell in a big way. And there's one last thing that I left off my initial list of things I've been telling companies lately, which is be careful and cautious with speculative investments. So the counter to that is, Whatever solution you provide, you will not frame it as something speculative and pie in the sky. You will frame it as something practical that delivers a solution to one of these major pain points. And if we think about total addressable market, if you can do something that hits these pain points, every company's gonna wanna talk to you. As for running a startup, I do, like I don't just run the Futurist Institute, I run Prestige Economics, right? I'm an economist by training. There are two things that drive financial markets. Do y'all know what they are? Supply and, Supply and demand. I thought this was South By. Don't you guys know it's fear and greed? <laughs> All day long, y'all. And right now in this fear and greed map, we are right here. It has swung to the fear side. Sack of money, sack of money on fire. Sack of money on fire is what everyone is worried about right now. So if you're running a startup, thinking about a few things operationally, number one, the more you lose, the more your worth is over. Wipe those words from your memory. 
They were great in that first season of Silicon Valley. I know you've all thought them. I've said them. The more you lose, the more your worth is over. Cash is king again, right? You might remember at the beginning of COVID, people said cash is king. And then some big investor folks came in and said cash is trash. Well, guess what? Le roi est mort, vive le roi, right? Cash is king again, baby. That's it. Investors are seeking less risky assets. Focus on ROI and corporate solutions as you're thinking about your own business strategies, your go-to-market strategy. What are you doing? Are you solving a major pain point that affects everyone? For example, Cold War II solutions. Supply chain is going to be really critical. If in the future you need to provide a lot more transparency of what goods you're consuming, you might want to use NFTs or blockchain in a, like not Lambo kind of way, but like in a marking goods in a supply chain kind of way to be able to trace where everything comes from so that someday those laptops, those cell phones can be sold and you can demonstrate the provenance of the products in them so that the U.S. government and U.S. Customs and Border Protection knows they do not come from China. That's coming. Consider also counterparty risks, including financial. I think, obviously, Silicon Valley Bank is a big one. We can talk, I think, in the Q&A. We'll probably talk a little more about that. And acquire, don't be acquired. Right now, if you're looking to make acquisitions, by the way, the big companies know this with high interest rates. If you've got cash, because cash is king, everything's cheaper than, than you're going to get it when the interest rates are lower. Buy now. But if you're looking to be acquired, be cognizant that you might be selling on the cheap just because of math. <laughs> Disclaimer, I know you're all going to read it. Everything could be wrong. And uh, with that, yeah, I'm happy to open it up for Q&A. I don't know, how much time do we have, Jordan? We got a little time here? 13 minutes. Let's do some Q&A, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, post the Silicon Valley Bank uh, situation, you know, what do you, th where do you kind of judge the political and fiscal appetite? So, Federal Reserve, FDIC, mm -hmm. all of that, versus um, to alleviate the situation, and where sure. do you see the political side? So, Congress, sure. the executive branch. Great. Thank you very much. So, questions around Silicon Valley Bank. Okay. Number one, I want to point out this is really important for all of you to know. FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, insures up to $250,000 of every bank account. If you have more than $250,000, it is not insured by the FDIC, and you may or you may not get your money back. Statements issued on Friday from the FDIC regarding SVB show that hopefully on Monday people will have access to their FDIC funds. However, if you have anything above 250, you then get a dividend voucher, which may never be paid back to you for whatever's above the 250. Along those lines, S&P Global Market Intelligence did an analysis of the banks at the end of the year, 2022. Out of 100 banks, Silicon Valley Bank was number 99 in terms of the lowest, like, like it was 99 out of 100 for the lowest percentage of accounts that were fully FDIC insured. Only 2.7% of the bank accounts at Silicon Valley Bank will be fully insured by FDIC. 97.3% are not. So that's a lot of money that could very well be gone. From a regulatory standpoint, and I had worked at Wachovia, which became Wells Fargo. Um, these kinds of things have happened before, where there's kind of a deal that folks, regulators, banking, everyone tries to put together to prevent financial institutions from failing. This is the second biggest bank failure in US history after Washington Mutual. Over 200 billion um, in, in assets. This is, this is just a mess. The 16th largest bank in the US, I think. But the, but the biggest concern is, for companies that had money there, most of them were in accounts that weren't FDIC insured. So the takeaway for all of you, operationally, is bank with more than one bank. 
And you can create more than one account, right? Like, like the, the financial advisor where I keep my mother's trust, they have a waterfall situation. When the bank account hits $250,000 and a penny, it automatically creates another bank account, which goes all the way back up to $250,000 and a penny, and then the penny rolls over, creates a new account. You need to be watching this, right? This is a cash management situation that you should be watching very closely because I know cash flow is everything, cash is king, runway is everything. This is going to be just, just absolutely critical for all organizations. And, and again, I think the question now is what happens, right? There's so many tech companies, many of you in this room, tech companies I've worked with, you wanna show your bona fides, what do you do? You bank with Silicon Valley Bank and now your capital may be trapped for who knows how long if, the, if it ends up in dividend vouchers where the asset base isn't covered and becomes non-recoverable. Right? It's all put in receivership now, but what happens next is the question. So I believe firmly the FDIC, the Fed, and others are working very hard this weekend so that a deal can be announced very quickly to prevent any kind of hemorrhaging or systemic cascade. Whether that happens or not, like, like I don't know. But um, the, the situation with Silvergate was somewhat similar to what happened to Silicon Valley Bank, right? There were treasuries. If you mark to market the value, you know, there, there was a loss. Silicon Valley Bank realized the loss, was trying to raise more capital, and it all fell apart when there was a run on the bank, Esse essentially by tech folks who, who you know, could see this all coming together. So this is a, a, a really big challenge that the regulators are going to want to fix fast. Otherwise, people are going to go, hey, what about my small regional bank? Is it safe? Are my accounts safe? What about the treasuries there? And this was all triggered, too, because Moody's, the rating agency, was you know, looking at downgrading multiple notches Silicon Valley Bank. So the rating agencies are now going to be under pressure to, more, to, to put more scrutiny on the financial institutions and customers are going to be watching this closely because they're terrified. What happens, right? Maybe your money wasn't at Silicon Valley Bank. I didn't have any money at Silicon Valley Bank. But I'm double-checking every account I've got, everyone in my family. Like, is everything at or under 250000 Okay, good. We're good. So, I mean, that's, that's really big. And, and the problem with Silicon Valley Bank was it was also very heavily VC tech focused and part of the reason the mark to market and the loss happened is because tech companies have been under a cash crunch because of all the financial market stuff I talked about, those higher bond yields, other places people can put their money and get almost a risk free return. That really hurt cash flow for some of the businesses that drew down the reserves for Silicon Valley Bank and the crypto side and the implosion of FTX weighed on Silvergate. So they were both relatively undiversified in their customer base, those things were also major contributing factors. The winners are probably going to be bigger banks. I know Chase had set up a war room to pull over accounts, people working KYC, AML 24-7 to pull over, set up new accounts for Silicon Valley customers. I'm sure other banks were doing the same. You're, you're going to see the bigger banks that have the more solid balance sheets probably end up winning, and there could be more pressure on regional banks. And I suspect, like I said, I, I don't necessarily think, I, I don't expect this is the camel's nose under the tent for another global financial crisis. But, I mean, the regulators and the rating agencies should have seen, like, this isn't a shock that interest rates are higher than they were a year ago. You know, so there, there's going to be a lot of questions around that but there's never just one cockroach. So I would expect other banks might have problems. Please. An another SVB question. What about knock-on effects, payroll, maybe some bankruptcies for lack of yep. cash? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think another, you know, if I was running a really big tech company and I had a lot of cash, I would be looking for fire sales this week. You know, I think you're going to see some smaller tech companies are really going to struggle, right? If all you get is 250, many companies can't even meet their payroll with that on Monday. And that's, you know, assuming it does come through the way the FDIC has said. And then what happens on the valuation side? What happens with the businesses? You're probably going to see a, a very fast slew of acquisitions. 
and you're going to see you know, just a lot of dislocations. So I, I think you're gonna see some real challenges. That's why I think the regulators are gonna work really fast to try to get a deal done of some kind to preserve the assets and those uh, non-insurable deposits above the 250, because otherwise I, I think you're gonna see cascading effects, especially in tech. It, it's, it's just such a, it, it's just such, it was just such a, a standard for many tech companies to be doing the business with SVB. I'm sorry to hear that. No, sorry. Please. I wonder if you have some thoughts on the 1.6 trillion in federal student loan debt that's been on hold since 2020 and how that might impact the economy if that were to turn back on. Sure, thank you very much. So the question is 1.6 trillion in student loan debt, which is about 10% of all outstanding, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, about 10% of all outstanding debt in the whole country. 16.9 trillion is the big number. You know, right now we're deleveraged. If those debt amounts come due, right, they're not due all at once, right? So if those debts do come due and people have to start repaying them, you know, we could see some folks struggle with that. You could see the debt delinquency number go up, but we're at 2.5% right now for all the debt out of the 16.9 trillion that's delinquent. Put this in perspective, in the wake of the housing crisis around 2010, it was almost 12% that was delinquent. So essentially, you would need, to, to be as bad as it was at the financial crisis, you would need all 1.6 trillion to all be delinquent immediately by everybody. And it's not due immediately, right? This, this, th th these things are paid out over many, many, many years, in case, some cases many decades, right? So I think we would see if those come due, and the, the charges resume, you would just see that delinquency rate go up. I don't know how much, but we're starting at a really good position. Mortgages are solid, consumer is solid. Even if those come due, I, I, I'm less concerned about that systemically. But for some individuals, it will be, you know, it will be a challenge. Please. Thanks. Um, you talked about ways to mitigate risk, considering everything going on, but do you think that there are opportunities to be learned and just would love to hear your perspective on that? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, the question is, what are the, the ways that we could mitigate risk, looking at these challenges, and what lessons can we be learning, right? I think the first lesson that the, the regulators are learning this lesson really fast, which is, you know, you need to take a bite of the cake and find out what's in it, right? And this is kind of what happened at the time of the, the housing crisis, the financial crisis. The way I kind of described that was with modern portfolio theory, the idea was you took a little bit of the super high grade stuff, some of the mid grade, and some of the bottom, and somehow it all became worth more than, than the sum of the parts. And I refer to these as wedding cakes made out of dog crap. And what, what it was is you took like a bowl of the world's finest sugar, a big bag of mediocre flour and a pile of dog crap, and you put it together and you made wedding cakes. And they looked so good. But then you had a couple of French portfolio managers want to take a bite, and they did, and then suddenly everybody knows they're, they're made out of dog crap and the whole thing falls apart. So I, I do believe you're going to see regulators I think you're gonna see activist investors. I think you're going to see the FDIC and the Fed more directly scrutinize the balance sheets of banks to make sure we don't see further implosions. And for risk, otherwise, how do we mitigate the risks we face? I mean, I think always being aware that counterparty risk is present, right? Many, I, I, I worked with companies that had Lehman Brothers as a, a, a counterparty. They had hedged steel prices or they had hedged energy prices. Well, that hedge or that insurance, or maybe I'll see these TikTok videos like get an IUL life insurance policy, become your own bank, right? Oh God, right? I'm sure you've all seen these. Well, make sure the company that you have a counterparty agreement with has a really good credit rating. You know, insurance companies have different credit ratings. If you go with one that doesn't, you may never get there. Right? I mean, you may never get there anyway. But, but the point is, you know, understanding counterparty risk is important and thinking about and understanding what risks you have in your operations. Always critical, um, especially now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Hello, I'm sure you're aware of the uh, CHIPS Act and the yes. negative impacts that it's going to have on the uh, Chinese economy. And uh, you indicated the future effects on the Chinese economy as we move away from Chinese hardware. I work closely in the DOD space, so I've been tracking that for a while. Um, you mentioned the importance of automation and uh, improving like labor shortage issues. Uh, you know, to me that implies like the need for, you know, GPUs and AI like based hardwares, uh, you know, how can American, you know, business owners and entrepreneurs like better take advantage of uh, hardware shortages and combat those problems in that sp specific sector? And Great. Also, you oh. know, what do you see the U.S. government doing in the way of investments and subsidies in that sector? Okay, great. Thank you very much. So the question is around the CHIPS Act and semiconductors and more technology. Yeah, obviously, we're moving ever greater automation is, is coming. There's uh, a Nobel Prize winning economic equation of how you get economic growth, and there's three components, capital, labor, technology. And the technology piece is going to become more critical. Semiconductors then become more critical. You're going to see, I think, I, I mean, in addition to investment, I think you're going to see more tariffs, more trade restrictions around everything related to Chinese high-tech, Chinese semiconductors, their access to semiconductor tech. We've already seen this. I think it's going to dial up, and, and that's where I think the eventual implication is this is not the end market for any Internet-connected devices made in China. It will not be. That will be streng verboten. That, that would be my expectation. So I think there, will, there might be more financing along with that, but I expect there will most certainly be more regulations along with it. Thank you. I think this will probably be our last one, right, Jordan? Yeah, cool. Let's Thank do it. You. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, right, let's cool. do it. So uh, I know you said the Fed inflation target rate was 2%. Yeah. But it seems like the Fed's getting a lot of criticism because in, during the 70s, we had much higher inflation, and Volcker had raised the rates gradually, and that would have prevented SV, you know, Silicon Valley Bank implosion. So do you see in the future them either not raising or have an emergency session reducing the rate? Yeah. temporarily? Okay, great. That's a great question. So uh, I, I, I thank you very much. I don't think the Fed's going to change its 2% target. I do think that Silicon Valley Bank will make the Fed think about, do they want to do a 50 basis point rate hike on the 22nd of March or only 25 basis points just to prevent jostling the market? I think there were several contributing factors to the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. It was not just the higher interest rates. I think, and there was a great Reuters article out early this morning about this. It, it, there were a whole other set of contributing factors, right? Being overly consolidated in, in, in one sector. Uh, there, there was some sort of paperwork, logistic and legal things that happened along the way. And, you know, selling it, taking a loss before you do the capital raise, it, you know, it, it, it uh, you know, in hindsight, this is going to be a really, this will be a quintessential MBA case study, right, going forward, that people will be talking about forever. But I, I don't think the Fed doing another 25 or 50 basis points would or would not have prevented that. And raising their target to 3%, the, the real reason the Fed has to get that rate down is because we have $16.9 trillion in consumer debt. The government has 31 to $32 trillion in government debt. Ten-year treasuries near 4% is a lot more expensive to finance at 31 to 32 trillion dollars than to refinance that at 3%. So they want to push those long rates down because otherwise we're going to see a lot more of US budget for the entire economy go to servicing the interest on our debt and th that that will be that will be a problem that could really hurt. It's almost like a liquidity trap. It 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 can it's sort of a liquidity trap but it's for the entire economy and the whole country. Yeah. Yeah. And this is why they got to get it down to 2%. Well, look, I'll be here for a few minutes. I thank you all very much. If anyone wants a copy, happy to give it. Thank you.